Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Zscaler's virtual CXO Summit Summer Series. The new enterprise CXO priorities protect valuable data, optimize performance, preserve the environment in a three-part series. Today is episode one, reducing the risk and complexity of secure cloud deployment. In a moment, we'll hear from our CXO Perspectives panel, including um, Graham Ludlow, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer of a global hospitality company, and Paolo Valotti, CISO and VP of Operations from Tate & Lyle, a global food supplier. They'll share their transformation journeys to the cloud and the challenges they had to overcome along the way. Following that, Zscaler's Vice President of Product Management, Moinul Khan, deconstructs a real-world data breach, describing its genesis, development, and impact before providing guidance on best practice, prevention, and response. In addition, he'll introduce the Zscaler Cloud Protection Suite, demonstrating its cloud security posture management and lateral threat movement, elimination capabilities, and much more. But first, let us kick off our CXO Perspectives panel. It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and our moderator today, Rich Campagna, Zscaler's SVP of Cloud Protection. Rich, please take it away. Great, thank you, Kavitha, and welcome everyone. I'm super excited about this topic. Uh, I think it's it's very timely for uh, for a lot of you, and we have two fantastic speakers here on the on the panel, followed by a, a really am amazing and interesting demo uh, that's kind of going to explore uh, a real world cloud security incident. So with that, let's kick it off. I'd like to introduce or to welcome, excuse me, uh, Graham Ludlow and Paolo Velati. Gentlemen, thank you so both both for so much for being here. If you guys can go ahead and start your videos, there we go, perfect. Okay, great. So let's uh, let's start the topic off uh, with one about you know your respective respective journeys. You know, I think a couple of years ago if we were having a panel discussion like this. The hot topic probably would have been, hey, have you moved to the cloud yet? And if so, what have you found? Uh, but you know, at least in my observation, dealing with uh, you know talking to CISOs, CIOs what have you uh, on a daily basis, pretty much everyone has gone to the cloud now, but there's kind of an interesting next stage in the journey, which is this, this maturation of your, your cloud deployments and the move from you know, things like a single cloud platform to a multi-cloud platform, that has obviously a big impact on uh, you know, not only uh, your, your organization as a whole, but definitely on security and risk. So moving from single cloud to multi-cloud seems like a lot of organizations are, are going through that process now. Uh, and the other big piece is the move from sort of a lift and shift of, uh, you know, traditional applications um, from the data center out to the cloud to a more broad adoption of cloud native services. So I think both of these things are, are top of mind for a lot of the folks that are on the call here today. So I'd love to kick it off and just, you know, get some of your thoughts on, you know, as you've gone through those two progressions, what has changed? What are some of the risk and security impacts? And what are the other things that, that folks need to keep in mind? as they make those transitions. So Paulo, maybe we'll start with you. Thoughts here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Rich. Uh, uh, very excited about joining uh, this event today. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, a few years ago, everybody was talking about cloud, 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 and it was about mostly saving money and uh, getting rid of the on-prem infrastructure as much as possible and move to something uh, cheaper uh, and more scalable to some extent. But now, people realize cloud is, is much more than just saving money. And they also realize there is a security component attached to it, which is great uh, for us as a CISO. Um, but uh, yeah, so initially, I think a lot of people look at cloud as, uh, as an opportunity to consolidate everything. They look at uh, most likely best suite if they had you know, large agreement with Microsoft, they look at Azure as the first option. But then the uh, company realized there are uniqueness uh, in, in the services provided by, by the big three or big four, uh, if you consider China uh, being different. Um, and then on top of that, there is a, a, a large number of uh, SaaS solutions that popped up uh, in, uh, over, over the last uh, several years. And, uh, and I think a lot of people are looking at SaaS as, as another way to optimize the, um, um, their application portfolio. Um, so if you, if you look at those, you probably have 
10, 15 major cloud providers to some extent, either one way it being SaaS or the other being infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. And each, each of them is very unique. So even on the SaaS side, some of the provider will give you uh, their own security structure and they have their own way to log stuff. So how do you pull all together? And when it comes to infrastructure as a service, if you look at uh, Azure versus uh, Google or, or AWS, uh, the security stack is, is slightly different, um, starting from the network implementation. Um, and even, even the access to those cloud need to be protected in a proper way. So the complexity there is, is fairly big. And, and as a CISO or security professional, we need to understand what is the trade-off between full functionality and having a decent or an acceptable level of security when you deliver those type of services. Gotcha. It seems like quite a challenge. I mean, in the in the data center world, presumably most organizations will have, you know, obviously multiple data centers, but probably will have consolidated on a, a single or at least very similar architectures. But here, of course, uh, could be very different architectures across the board. So. Exactly. I, I think, uh, yes, we, we were used to have uh, a single hypervisor with uh, either Microsoft or VMware and uh, and that was about it. Uh, and uh, the biggest issue we had was uh, how much fuel we had in the uh, for the for the diesel generator. In the case the power failed. Uh, now it's actually <laughs> correct. So uh, so presumably you got three times the headcount then to deal with these three architectures, correct? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Of course, uh, I, I was I was thinking about four times, but uh, yeah, three <laughs> times would be good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Graham, how about you? I, Paula just talked quite a bit about uh, moving to a multi-cloud environment. Um, you know, what do we see when, when uh, you know, the other part of my question, when we talk about moving to from, you know, lift and shift of, let's say, traditional VMs to the public cloud to more replatforming and adoption of cloud native services, what sort of impact does that have on security? So really pretty fundamental impact. Um, you know, as companies did the, we're going to move our infrastructure into cloud infrastructure hosting services is relatively easy to translate existing security capabilities and processes into those environments. You have a vulnerability scanner here, you put a vulnerability scanner there. You have standards for Windows servers here, you apply standards for Windows servers there. It wasn't easy, but it was achievable. Um, when you look at now refactoring applications, moving to platform as a service instead of infrastructure as a service, you look at moving into SaaS, those fundamental security capabilities simply no longer operate. You know, add to that, you've added a whole new control plane for your applications and for your infrastructure. You never really had to consider and protect before. That's why you see so many companies having data breaches for S3 buckets. They go into these environments. They don't really have governance processes. They don't have the experience and the knowledge on how to secure and ensure that they're configured and deployed correctly. Um, and so you end up with misconfigurations and you end up with data breaches. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, we, we've seen that certainly you mentioned uh, S3 bucket exposures. You know, there were a large number of, of organizations a couple of years back that, um, you know, had some really, you know, high profile incidents as a result of that. And I, you know, I think that, um, you know, what you're describing, Graham, is, is probably a, a combination of things. You know, obviously there's, um, you know, this is a brand new uh, attack surface to be monitoring and, and kind of watching. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the same time, it's a quickly evolving attack surface, right? I remember there was, a, there was an announcement maybe, um, maybe about a month ago from Azure uh, where they introduced on a single day over 250 new features and services. And uh, those features and services are available immediately, of course, uh, you know, to all the developers on your, on your teams uh, to go you know, you know, grab hold of them and, and start uh, testing them out and using them and, and maybe even pushing code in, in production using them, which is, which is a really you know, daunting and scary kind of thing. In fact, you know, I think at last count, Azure had over 600 individual services uh, listed on their site and you know um, AWS and GCP each have a couple of hundred as well so you think you're talking about across these just these three platforms uh, you know thousands of, of different services uh, that your teams can use um, and so so I'm curious Graham uh, you know in, in light of that you know that's perhaps one of the things that leads to some of these misconfigurations just this rapid pace of innovation but another challenge of course is is hiring. 
right? Um, you know, we we all are familiar with uh, with uh, you know the the relative lack of of cloud skills out there and the the difficulty in acquiring. I mean, you're 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 competing against the cloud providers themselves for talent. You know, folks like Google and, and Amazon Web Services. Um, so I'm I'm curious, you know, how Graham have you approached you know this this problem of of developing and or acquiring uh, cloud skills into your team. Any any uh, anything that you've learned over that journey that you can share with the audience? Yeah, most definitely. And I'll just say I'm experiencing some technical issues on my end. So if I cut off, please move on. Um, the the basic knowledge about how cloud operates is something that everyone in the security team needs to understand. It doesn't matter if you're doing GRC work, compliance work, technical work, operations, cybersecurity. The whole security team really needs to be upskilled to be able to understand these platforms and, and do their basic jobs. Has been through um, getting a lot of exposure to the security team, to our applications teams who are developing and uh, you know, get them exposed to our CD, CI CD pipeline, let them understand what is Terraform, what is Ansible, you know, how are these new tools defining our infrastructure and our architecture and getting them really hands-on in these new environments. So again, just fundamentally, they understand how they operate. Once you get that basic understanding, then you sort of know what you don't know. And then the transfer from bottom up in terms of this is our security process today. We have this crazy new cloud environment where nothing works anymore, at least because they understand the environment. They're able to apply those processes, you know, look at new tools and ensure that we're delivering appropriate security into those environments. So, you know, it's, it's nothing special is really give your people time to breathe, you know, give them direct exposure to the teams that are pushing into these cloud environments that have that knowledge and experience and making sure that they have the opportunity to participate in that security evolution, to take your security program from a kind of an on-premise legacy architecture into more microservice cloud architecture. Okay, interesting. I like that, you know, sort of the, the I guess the, the teaming aspect between the, the, let's say the app dev or the, um, the cloud team and the, and the InfoSec team. Was that a, like a, a program that you, you formalized or is this just more of an informal, you know, some sort of pairing? How, did, how do you operationalize something like that across the teams to make sure that it's happening? So you, we really had to push people there in a way because I think a lot of people in IT or maybe are introverts and don't naturally necessarily socialize, but also they're so busy with their day jobs, it's hard for them to even know, who, you know who's doing this. So we've done a few things to sort of institutionalize that. Um, one is we do a lot of uh, cross meetings. So we have intentional meetings with other functional teams just to touch base and say, what's going on? You know, how are things going? You know, what major projects are you working on? We've invited other teams to our team meetings and vice versa. We've attended some other team meetings to make sure that we're aligned. And we've set up formal sessions where um, we've done sort of technology reviews and previews where they do a demo, you know, here's our new AWS or Salesforce or GCP instance, and here's how it works and here's how it operates. So it's, it is definitely something that has to be done intentionally, something has to be reinforced, but the feedback from the teams has been excellent. I mean, people love to learn new things, you know, people love to learn new skills and new environments. And I just think, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that opportunity. Gotcha. No, I, I like that a lot. I mean, just just that that exposure. I mean, I think you know, obviously, one uh, one approach is to is to you know get folks um, you know connected into uh, you know formalized training, which I assume is is part of the program uh, as well. But you know, there's nothing really uh, replaces the the hands on and kind of the learning from a, a peer type of um, you know type of education. I, mean, I think that's where you can only learn so much. You know, watching videos and, and reading documentation. It's when you actually get hands on and, and, and are able to talk to somebody that's experienced in the environment there. That's when the learning really starts to uh, starts to accelerate. So, OK, interesting. So very much focus on skills development. How about you, Paulo? How's, how have you approached this this skills gap problem? Uh, yeah, this uh, this has been a challenge uh, um, over the last several years. So, so um, I would say no, I agree. For, formal training, very helpful uh, to build the foundation. But then uh, training will never tell you, you know, the customization or the level of customization a lot of companies will, will want to achieve when they develop custom application, um, especially if they are, they are consumer facing. Um, I would say hands-on keyboard is, is definitely very important. 
and the um, cross training. So trying to understand what the application developers or the application team are trying to achieve. And also for the application team, understand why we are so difficult to work with as a security professional um, is important. So because it's not, it's not just like we like technology and, and we want to make uh, life harder for people. We want to make sure that our companies are safe and secure and, and defensible in the case something happened. Um, so I think um, it goes back to also providing the time and the opportunity for the team to be able to spend time learning because the pe people are so busy and they say, oh, no, no, I'm too busy. I I'm working 10, 12 hours a day and I can't really find any time for training. But actually training is, is a key component of every, every person's job description. It should be part of uh, the development plan that everybody has uh, at, at uh, his or her disposal because otherwise you'll, you'll be stuck uh, uh, with technology that is a 10, 10 year old or, or, or older. And, and you'll never be able to be successful in, in developing and, and providing very good service uh, with, with the new cloud solution that are today available. So I, I think uh, people are excited about learning. They, they, what they need to learn though, is also to give time to, to learn new things and, and to experience and, and some keyboard uh, how to secure the cloud environment. Gotcha. Excellent. So what, I, what, you mentioned an interesting thing there, which is, you know, uh, I'll paraphrase here, but you, you mentioned you explained to their teams why security is is difficult, right? Or why why the security team is is, is difficult. Um, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I mean, has has that you know? Do you think you know the the development teams? Um, you know, how has the the pairing gone? You know, between these teams, and and does that approach work? I mean, I think that's that's important, right? I mean, ultimately, the the uh, security team and the development teams are somewhat at odds in terms of their ultimate objective, right? Security team needs to needs to mitigate risk. The application development team, their their objective is to you know ship new applications and and products as quickly as possible. So there's almost some built-in you know sort of sort of tension there. Um, you know how has that gone as security has started to become more and more part of the development process? Any uh, any roadblocks there that you run into? Yeah, I mean. Um... Yeah, I think it's a complicated relationship. It's a, lo a love and hate a relationship between the application or the development team and, and the security uh, people. I think the the best way for for this relationship to work is is uh, pro being proactive um, on both sides, actually. Because so on the security side, what we can do is we can build uh, service catalog catalogs uh, with all the security services already canned. And, and available for the application team to consume. So instead of building, as an example, uh, accounting and, uh, and, and logging um, modules for every single new application in a, in a very different fashion all the time, I would just build uh, something that is standard and applicable and then manage the small percentage of exception as an exception through a, a more co complicated and, and a longer longer process. But if I can leverage on the same authentication authorization model and logging model and, and securing storage and, and, and what's not, it will be much easier for the application team to, to consume them. Um, on the other end, the expectation from the application team uh, from, from a security side, um, it's really to, to engage the security team uh, at the very early stage of the design, uh, once they are even just developing the business case. Uh, because cost is, is one driver, definitely. But if you don't have enough money to secure the solution in the proper way, it's very difficult to add to a project security later because there is no business case behind security. But if you sell it as part of the overall deal, it's going to be difficult, different and much easier for, for us to, to justify it. Um, at the same time, designing it together make it easier because if there are this uniqueness so we have enough time to figure out how to, to solve it, and and uh, be ready whenever the production will be uh, the, the application production will be launched. Gotcha. Okay, so you have set sort of standards and and guardrails in place, as well as just a a process around early engagement uh, with with the application teams, so that they're planning for security in advance. Exactly. I think to talking to each other would be one of the foundational things I would I would recommend anybody to do. <laughs> it sounds so basic, right? But uh, but uh, 
so often so difficult inside of not just you know between infosec and application development teams. So I like that like talking to each other. <laughs> Fantastic. So and so Graham, if, I think I'm not sure I see you coming in and out. I know you're having some some technical difficulties here. Um, but you know one of the things you mentioned before was um, you know uh, getting your team involved with you know some of the you mentioned a couple of the <clears throat> excuse me tools. Uh, in the in the CI/CD pipeline, uh, just getting them um, hands on there, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about you know kind of the you know this DevOps uh, and you know the impact on culture and and process. I mean, I think this has upended a lot of things uh, for for organizations over the over the last couple of years, where there's just this 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 focus on you know constantly um, you know shipping new product. There's a whole new set of of processes, but importantly, I think it has an impact on on culture and, and and Paula just talked a little bit about that you know sort of this this um, you know relationship between the application development teams and and uh, security teams you know what are your what are your thoughts there what does DevOps mean for an infosec leader and and how should they be planning for you know kind of this new I mean I think this ties into the the cloud native uh, applications um, you know discussion as well you know how do you how do you plan for that what what are they likely to encounter. So the fundamental shift here, as we've learned over the past few years, is you used to have server admins who built servers, network admins who built networks, and coders who wrote code. And today, your application development teams, they're building servers. They are building networks. They're building whole infrastructures as code. You know, when I first saw the term infrastructure as code, I kind of chuckled. I thought it was a clever little, you know, marketing phrase, but it, it, it's actually embodies that fundamental difference in how environments exist today versus how they used to exist. And the ramifications of that are fairly profound. Um, you know, going back to what I said earlier about looking at your security processes, if you expect to have a data center with a number of servers running a number of applications, you approach it in a particular manner. And you do periodic vulnerability scanning, you can do penetration testing, it's sort of a, a physical thing that you can really wrap your, your head around. Well, in these new environments where you're writing your infrastructure and your applications, it's microservice, there are no servers. Um, you can spin up a data center with 10 million servers and services that are all talking to each other and spin it down with a couple lines of code. Um, wrapping your, your head around that, conceptually speaking, and then practically being able to ensure that those environments are being well built and secured, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Um, the, the other marketing phrase, shift left, and you need to shift your security left. If you're provisioning servers in code, don't wait for the server to be provisioned to do a security scan, check it in the code. Make sure that as it's being built and defined, that it, it is uh, meeting your standards, that it's up to date. Um, if you're deploying a new service, how is it segmented? You know, is it publicly available and is exposing an API that um, turns out credit cards and uh, social security numbers? Or is it a private API with appropriate authentication and encryption to make sure that it can't be abused? And I think it's that shift in mindset and process to be more tightly integrated, you know, with those development processes to do your security evaluations before your servers even exist is first and foremost, a massive opportunity. Because I can't tell you how many times in my career, something got deployed to production and there was no security checks and there was a lot of work that had to be done to get it up to snuff. And it's really hard to change something once it's actually in production. If you're doing your security while it's being developed and it's integrated into that, it's sort of the holy grail for security because we can make sure that nothing ever gets deployed unless it's deployed securely. Now that has the challenge. Again, you can't run a vulnerability scan on a server that doesn't exist yet. Um, so there is a tooling aspect of this. You actually need new technical capabilities that can do vulnerability and configuration management, security assessments, um, access management assessments in those environments. And when still thing exists solely as code, as an idea, before it ever gets to production. Great, actually a quick follow-up on that one. So. Yeah, you know, I saw an interesting stat. I think it was from GitHub, you know, the other day that says that the average repository has more than 200 open source uh, dependencies, right? And you know, obviously, on on the tails of things like the Solar Winds incident, um, you know, software supply chain is a is a big you know kind of hot topic. Um, and and you just mentioned there, you know, you can't do vulnerability scans on on a server that doesn't exist yet. But 
you know, how does, how does open source factor into what you just described, Graham? And is that a big thing that you spend a lot of time, you know, being concerned with, or, or do you think it's less of an issue? I think it is an issue. And I, you know, I would, I would say that the issue isn't that it is open source. The issue is that you're dependent on code written by third parties that you don't necessarily have control over. So there's two risks there. One is it can be poisoned. It can actually have intentional malware deployed into it, or it could just have a, a major vulnerability. But if you're heavily reliant on that, um, then, uh, then that can be a major problem. And you know, a great example of that would be something like Apache Struts, which we all know was involved in a, a major data breach. And you know, without opining on, on that particular situation, in the legacy world with servers and networks, getting to a problem like that, finding it is incredibly hard and solving it is even harder. In this new DevOps and Dev Security Ops world, you would have discovered that vulnerability and been aware of it, again, during the development process and be able to fix it in the development process and carry through the fix all the way into your production environments in a way that would just be so much fundamentally easier than it is to retroactively fix something like that. Um, uh, because if you have awareness of it at the beginning of the process, you don't need to do all the homework and research to find out where was that vulnerability introduced? You know, what package was it part of? You know, what, uh, what library was that a part of? Because the way that these new processes and tools work, that's exactly what they do. So instead of deconstructing something to find a problem, you're finding it while the blueprint's still on the, uh, the drawing table, so to speak. Okay, great, excellent perspective. And I guess you know one of the, one thing that um, you know I hear a lot that that you didn't necessarily mention there directly is that you know finding an issue in uh, you know development cycle is uh, is not only you know better from a security standpoint because you're not then running even for any period of time insecure code in production, but uh, it's a lot less costly as well, right? So more secure Absolutely. and less costly, right? You don't have to go through all this rework, retest, redeploy, etc. So, yep. okay, yeah, you excellent. find it early and you fix it early and it's much, much more cost effective. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so let me let me switch gears just a little bit here. Um, I don't think any, uh, you know, panel on, uh, on uh, related to InfoSec would be complete without at least touching on the topic of, of ransomware uh, because it's on the, on the top of mind for so many. But since this is the topic on, on cloud, um, you know, I, I thought, you know, maybe we could talk a bit about um, you know, to some extent, uh, cloud and what you guys are discussing. I mean, these are new approaches to to security that you're adopting as you as you move to cloud. Uh, and and ransomware has become a thorn in the side uh, in the side of, uh, of of CISOs and, and CIOs and what have you for for quite some time now. And we still haven't quite you know quite fully you know solved uh, solved the challenge because we still see some issues from from time to time. So what does um, you know, if, with with kind of a fresh start to let's say our new data data center infrastructure from a security standpoint, you know, what opportunities do we have in the cloud to perhaps get a better handle on uh, thwarting this uh, this ransomware uh, issue that continues to plague organizations? Paulo, any uh, any thoughts there on, on what we might do as we make this migration? Oh yeah, I mean uh, that that's a, a, a very good question. I mean, yeah, ransomware it, it's been on uh, on the newspaper uh, first pages for for the last several months now, and and uh, and uh, yeah, the, the the recent uh, announcement of uh, some larger companies paying a uh, fairly significant amount of money, like forty plus million, um, to the um, criminals uh, to. Um, to provide the uh, decryption keys is, is kind kind of uh, um, concerning, especially in the context of the fact that uh, some of the cyber insurance are not willing to pay a ransom anymore. Um, so if you if you think about that, now it becomes a real risk risk. And and I think uh, knowing what is in the cloud to begin with uh, is very important. So the cl cloud opens. So we we started. You know, data center, traditional data center, everything is within your, your four walls, you know, exactly what you have kind of, uh, or most of what you have. Then you move to the cloud and, and people can spin up new servers uh, uh, to ground point with few line of codes. And now you have multi-cloud and you have SaaS. So your data are really almost everywhere. And, and if you think about uh, just the advantage of knowing exactly what you have and what, what, how does your attack surface look like, in, especially in the context of a ransom, what, what could be compromised by a ransom? 
ransomware if if it gets into your infrastructure is 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 very important. So I think the first is is understanding and visibility of what is out there uh, from from a, from a data and and um, infrastructure perspective. And then I would say uh, the most important thing is really do continuous scanning and monitoring of everything that is open. So the uh, the fact that you know one day you may have virtual desktop open to the internet because some some developer or some some infrastructure guy decided to uh, open it up for some testing uh, is a real risk. And that's that's what the attacker are waiting for. Oh yeah, RDP is open three three eight nine. Let's 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 do something with it. They they will try default password. They will try bypassing your or uh, stealing uh credentials they, they will try with vulnerabilities and, and eventually they will find a way to get in and once they are in um i think we need to rely on other layer of security such as micro segmentation to mitigate and reduce their ability to move laterally from one compromised server to the rest of the infrastructure and i think uh, preparedness in the case the range, so incident will happen right so there is no no hundred percent security a, 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 anywhere and I, I believe that preparedness uh, is very important. So testing, simulation, tabletop exercise, and making sure that you have all your process uh, uh, checked uh, for even paying a ransom. So how do you pay for a ransom, as an example? Um, and then the other concerning thing about ransomware, to be honest, is, is the fact that they evolve. First it was, okay, I, I'm going to um, encrypt your data, and then you have to pay to get the decryption key. Now they are saying, Oh, and by the way, if you don't pay, I'm going to sell your data somewhere. So it's about data exfiltration. So your IP, your personal identifiable information, your your uh, medical records, uh, your your credit card information may be sold on the dark web for for pennies in some cases, and that's another big risk, especially when it comes to consumer and uh, and vendor um, relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, that last piece you just described is becoming all more all more common, right? If someone decides not to pay the ransomware, the, you know, these folks, we call this, our threat labs team call this double extortion, right? Decide yeah. not to pay the ransomware. Uh, we're still going to sell it. We're still going to, we're going to get paid uh, as a, as the attacker um, either way. Right. Which is a, which kind of a, kind of a scary thought, right? So then you have to make this almost impossible decision between, you know, paying the ransomware or potentially having some very sensitive data exposed, which of course is a lot of, uh, get a lot of cleanup after the after the fact. Um, okay, great, Graham. How about you? Any um, you know thoughts on on this topic? Yeah, I, so I'll say one risk and one opportunity on this topic. Um, the uh, the new risk that we have to face here is again, if you run the clock, say twenty years, it was inconceivable that. And um, I'll, I'll pick on uh, let's say a Russian gang would not show up in Atlanta and uh, invade your data center, install encryption, you know, on, on their things and, and not allow you to get in. I mean, just literally imagine that environment, you know, like people with guns saying you cannot enter your data center. We're not letting you in unless you pay us a $40 million ransom, right? Um, but today they can do that from the comfort of their own homes and, and offices, right? They can do that from around the world because instead of having a physical data center that's physically secured, it's a virtual data center that's virtually secured. So this new attack service, this new control plane, whatever you want to call it, right? The things that we use to build and manage these environments, they're all digital now when, when they literally used to be physical. So we've taken what used to be a physical security risk and we've made it now an information security risk. So fundamentally, I think that's the new challenge we face with ransomware today with these new environments. They can take over the cloud. They've got protection from governments. You know, they've got a, a level of physical safety that they wouldn't have had before. Therefore, the opportunity cost for them to attempt this is so much lower than it used to be. Um, you know, it, the, the someone once told me, you know, the internet's like a bad neighborhood. You know, you can't necessarily trust it. The problem is the internet is everywhere and, and everything is a bad neighborhood, which kind of leads to the opportunity, which is segmentation. You know, I, I think Paolo is exactly right. When you look at segmentation and you look at the opportunity to um, you know, take the concept that we used to have, which our corporate network is secure, which I don't necessarily agree with, but fundamentally, the concept of having a zone that has more trust, that is segmented and protected makes sense. We just need to apply it instead of at the network and at the company layer, at the application and at the data layer. So when you look at a lot of new approaches, I know zero trust is a big marketing term, but it's completely legitimate. 
when you look at zero trust concepts and you say, we're going to build an application, we're going to compartmentalize it, we're going to protect it, we're going to encrypt it, and you can do it at that um, small scale or small resolution, whatever you want to call it, around a single app, first security becomes much easier to do, and it becomes less expensive because there's less noise to deal with. Now you combine that with infrastructure as code and intentional design and doing these security reviews before something gets built and something sort of magic happens. Now you can have your security teams work with your DevOps teams, define your applications and the infrastructure surrounding them to achieve that level of segmentation, that level of security, and then manage that through code. And now you have a defense that makes it so hard for an adversary to get into and then move laterally around your company that you can achieve phenomenal levels of security. So, you know, again, to reiterate, once while we do have a new risk with those same tools can be abused by the bad guys, if those tools are secured, you can develop environments that are so much more secure than, uh, than what we used to be able to achieve. Gotcha. Excellent. And I think that's it. That's sort of a good, you know, kind of kind of wrap up point on this on this topic. So, you know, if I just can just kind of recap a couple of the things we talked about, we talked about about skills de the development and the importance of getting, uh, as Paula put it, hands on keyboard and this this uh, cross pollination between the application teams and the infosec teams that, you know, perhaps haven't necessarily worked together so much in the past, but in the move to cloud have no choice but to but to work together. So I think that, you know, that's that's an important topic. You know, we talked about um, you know uh, solving things like misconfigurations and vulnerabilities across the entire uh, life cycle of a of a cloud deployment, right? Everyone, everywhere from when the application developer is writing code all the way into into production, uh, you know, production. Excuse me. Uh, and we talked about um, you know adapting strategies like micro segmentation and uh, and zero trust to kind of help minimize the blast radius of of you know, these types of attacks that um, otherwise could, could cause a lot of damage uh, to, to an organization. So I think these are you know, just a couple of the key you know, takeaways for me. Obviously we covered a lot of ground here in the, in the panel, but uh, Paulo, Graham, thank you so much. I think this has been for me a great learning experience and I'm sure for our audience as well. Uh, so I really appreciate the, the two of you taking the time here to, uh, to, to speak on the, on the panel.